Welcome. This is the St. Patrick's Day 2021 Ask an Atheist show. Except we at the Freedom from Religion Foundation don't believe in saints, but but we we do like to celebrate. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. We're co-presidents of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and this is FFRF's weekly Ask an Atheist show. Remember, you can ask a question via Facebook or email askanatheist at ffrf.org. We have a fascinating topic today, the forgotten founder, Thomas Paine. And we're excited to be joined by several individuals determined that Thomas Paine be forgotten no more, including a British political cartoonist who's illustrating a new graphic novel about Thomas Paine. We're going to show you some sneak previews of those illustrations. It's still a work in progress. And later, we'll be joined by another artist, the world-renowned sculptor, Zenos Frudakis, who's currently sculpting a statue of Thomas Paine. And we'll show you some sneak previews of that statue in the making. We'll also be joined by Margaret Downey, a Thomas Paine expert and an aficionado who will tell us more about why we need a memorial to Thomas Paine in Washington, D.C. Yes, it's about time. Before we bring on Margaret Downey and Zanos Frudakis, remotely from the States, we want to introduce our British guest, known by the pen name Polyp. He's Paul Fitzgerald, and he's a full-time political cartoonist, chair of the Manchester, U.K.-based Peterloo Memorial Campaign. And that's Paul at P-O-L-Y-P. Paul is his nickname. Paul Fitzgerald is an active member of the Skeptics Movement. He is an author and an illustrator of Speechless, a wordless world history. The Cooperative Revolution, Little Worm's Big Question, Think, an arsenal of incendiary cartoon skepticism, and Peter Liu, Witnesses to a Massacre. His new book is to be called Tom Paine's Bones, and it's about, of course, Thomas Paine. So, Paul, thank you for joining us today. I'm very pleased to be here. So, you're in Manchester. I visited Manchester in 2019, in the summer, and I saw, I saw some memorial about Peterloo, the Peterloo massacres, the names on the floor. Just tell us briefly yeah. about your Peterloo book and what was Peterloo? Well, it was um, it was a, a bit like Thomas Paine has been forgotten. Peterloo is like a turning point in the story of democracy that, that also got forgotten, or if you like, the memory that was suppressed. And we were so kind of shocked, a few activist friends, that there is no memorial to it in Manchester, that we decided to campaign on that. It was a huge, peaceful rally of pro-democracy demonstrators um, in England that got attacked by the uh, the military. Wow. Yeah. So that was tragedy, wasn't it? It's Peterloo because of Peter Square and Waterloo. Those two words came together yeah. there. So. So why a graphic novel on Thomas Paine, Paul? What What's so special about Thomas Paine? I wish I could remember when I first became aware of him. You know, once you once you started a project like this, you think back and you think, when did I first hear of him? And when did he first influence me? He certainly was part of, if you like, the Peter Lou story, in that um, uh, he, you know, he greatly influenced those campaigners. But shortly after the Peter Lou massacre, that's when Cobbett decided to bring Thomas Paine's bones to England, uh, hoping to ferment a rebellion in the aftermath of, uh, of the massacre. And, and that's kind of partly how I, I first got to know him. I think my real interest in him is, is like, he's a pro-democracy, undoubtedly a pro-democracy hero, you know? Uh, I think he's a proto-skeptic. I think he's somebody who, um, who you know, began that whole process of, of, if you like, not the glorification, but, 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 but the emphasis on logic and, and reason, which is something that's very, very important to me, a sort of Spock fan. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, he kind of seems to encapsulate all of the values that, that really, really matter to me. He was a bit of an engineer as well. I was really shocked to discover he designed a bridge, uh, as well as um, sparking the American War of Independence. So what a, what a fantastic and fascinating character. Well, he started off in, in um, the UK and then ended up fomenting our revolution in the United States. And I think we have a visual from your book about that. Of course, these are the times that try men's souls. 
beautiful, beautiful illustrations, Paul. And as you point out, he wrote Common Sense, which inspired the American Revolution. And didn't he name the country? Yes, he, he named the United States He named States the United of States of America. And, um, Paul, before we show some more of the visuals, um, do you feel that children in the U.K. are taught about Thomas Paine, or is he sort of a forgotten hero in the United Kingdom as well? I, th I think he's absolutely a, a forgotten hero. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, I, I presume you're immediately seeing that the graphic novels that I'm interested in tend to be uh, things that nobody else seems to want to talk about. I, I've always felt that if a piece of history or a character has been forgotten, inappropriately, then there's usually a very strong political reason for it. And in the case of Thomas Paine, of course, he was a great American hero until he wrote The Age of Reason, which attacked uh, mainstream religion. Uh, uh, his voice in Age of Reason is, is, is really interesting because he sounds so modern. He sounds so much like uh, somebody like Richard Dawkins, but it cost him a huge price. He, he, he was forced off his celebrity perch, if you like. and. Uh, pretty much died alone as a result. Uh, he died alone, very few friends left, surrounded by religious fanatics trying to get him to repent on his deathbed. Well, it, before yeah. we get to that and why the book is called Tom Paine's Bones, can we show a few more of the graphics? And there is an intriguing one, I think, coming up of a statue of him being toppled. Um, can you explain this sure. history? Well, one of the, the narrative techniques I used in Peter Lou, and I'm using it in, in Tom Paine's Bones as well, is just to use verbatim quotes. So I'm not actually writing any fiction. I don't, I don't really aspire to that novelist idea that I can somehow recreate the past. But as a result of that, the book becomes a little bit about the nature of history itself, because quite often I'll put contradictory quotes, you know, uh, sources that, that don't actually agree with each other and let the reader make up their own mind. So when I came to draw this, which is the gilded statue of George III being torn down in um, Bowling Green Park in New York uh, uh, as a result of the, uh, the first reading of the Declaration of Independence, I started looking for contemporary visual references to this. Uh, now, there's loads of very sort of romanticized, politicized images of it, of all these American heroes. But one of the European illustrations I found of it seemed to indicate that the Sons of Liberty who claimed that they pulled the statue down, actually instructed their slaves to do it. And in the light of contemporary conflicts about statues, I thought, that's really nice and provocative, isn't it? That's going in. Yeah. Um, so Talk you can about see irony. That. You could see there the dark-skinned hands reaching up there, couldn't you? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah the real irony there. Like that. You know, like, I mean, the other... There are lots of inaccuracies in the source I used, in that the buildings are wrong and all that kind of stuff. But then the other sort of later illustrations are, are fairly inaccurate as well. And there's very, very little um, press about it, actually. I mean, normally I go to diaries and newspaper reports or court transcripts and stuff like that. There's very little information about it. So I thought, hell, I'm going to go with the um, most controversial interpretation. But we should clarify, of course, that Thomas Paine was an ardent abolitionist himself. <laughs> And then yeah, some he, of his very early writings, yeah. And, you know, he was a revolutionary. He ended up in France, correct? And we have some yeah. of your illustrations of him where he went there to fight for liberty. And then what happened to him, Paul? Well, in this particular illustration, um, it, it, it's quite interesting. Paine was, was arguing with, um, if you like, conservatives who were against the French Revolution. And, and these conservatives were claiming this is a mindless bloodbath. Payne was in the streets uh, during the height of the revolution when the terror was just beginning. And he'd walked out one day without uh, an appropriate uh, cockade on his hat, the, um, the, the, the little sort of rosette you can see. And he was nearly lynched by a mob in the street. It was, it was quite fascinating that he was arguing that no, the, uh, you know, the revolution is still very healthy, but this was one of his experiences. And it's one of many, many scrapes with death he had uh, throughout his life. Absolutely extraordinary story, his life story. You, you'd, you'd think it was uh, almost like a, a slapstick comedy, the number of times he, he missed being killed by a whisker. And so then, that's one of the first illustrations of that. And then he ended up being imprisoned, and I think we do have a graphic of that coming up. Oh, the guillotine. And what, what happened there, Paul? 
Well, as I say, I mean, Paine was very much in favour of the revolution in France, but he, when, when Robespierre and, and Marat and that sort of faction wanted to execute the king, Paine argued, well, no, you know, we've got this, this amazing moment in history where we're, we know, we're changing history. Let's not begin it by spilling blood. You know, he, he was not a vindictive, angry man, Paine. He was an extremely forgiving individual. But because he tried to rally support around the idea of exiling the French king to America, where he might actually learn something about democracy, um, and rallying people to vote uh, uh, for, for clemency, uh, Robespierre and Marat, who fascinating fanatics uh, responsible for the terror, they turned on pain and they put him in jail. They absolutely hated him. And again, he, he escaped the guillotine by an absolute whisker, a minor clerical error. Uh, meant that he wasn't executed the next day. And then, uh, of course, Robespierre fell, and he was eventually released. And then, Paul, he made excellent use of his time there in prison, correct? Uh, writing, I can't remember if it was volume one or volume two of The Age of Reason. Yeah, again, I mean, the, the, the records are a little thin on that. Just, uh, but, but certainly um, one of the, uh, the, the American, American diplomats said he was, uh, he was entertaining himself in prison by writing a pamphlet against Jesus Christ, which I thought was <laughs> one of the most patronizing summaries of hmm. the Age of Reason I've ever heard. Yeah, um, yeah but Age of Reason is also about science. It's, a, it's an amazing book. It, it, demand, it dismantles... Um, what Paine called revealed religion, where, uh, like, you have somebody who claims that God has whispered in their ear that they're now the authority and everybody should listen to them. Now, Paine, who was actually, surprisingly, a very religious man, he was a deist, he thought that this idea that the established one individual could, could bring this revelation to others. He thought it was absolute nonsense. He was far more like, if you like, sort of Einstein and perhaps to some extent Newton's idea that the, 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 the universe is a kind of a manifestation of a god, which is very, very interesting. It's a very uninstitutional way to see religion, I think. Well, he was a, a deist in the classical sense of the Enlightenment. Uh, Although some people called him an atheist, didn't, didn't they? Didn't believe in a personal well, God, and, and also yeah. did not have the benefit of Charles Darwin. Yeah. I think he would have given up his impersonal God <laughs> when science um, progressed, but it doesn't matter. Um, and so now we have some beautiful illustrations, pe sneak previews to show from um, graphics reciting Thomas Paine's words. And this, Paul, is my absolute favorite. The mind, once enlightened, cannot again become dark. And in fact, Dan, I heard you say something very similar when you first came out of the ministry, yeah. you know, that you can't turn off the light switch. <laughs> and um, it's, it's such a classic. Here's it is an error only and not truth that shrinks from inquiry. Yeah. And I mean, th this is what I'm saying about Paine being a proto-skeptic. You know, you could all you could quote that today as a modern voice, couldn't you? Oh yes. Um, and um, but his writing was there's some terrific ringing phrases in that Age of Reason. Yeah. And I think um, so. Then I think we have some graphics that you've done. Um, is there another one, Bruce? There. Um, that show the reaction, as you already uh, indicated, when he. When the age of he got out of prison safely, when the age of reason was printed, then then all hell broke out, right, Paul? Absolutely. I mean, he was hated in England for a long time already for for challenging um, royal authority, but of course, in challenging royal authority, he was he was not just challenging the idea of of, of a hereditary monarchy. I think he was challenging the idea of the divine right of kings. So he was already being prosecuted uh, here in England. But as you say, when Age of Reason came out, all hell broke loose. Um, effigies of him were burnt up and down the country. It became even more popular than burning effigies of Guy Fawkes. Huh. Um, and one of those happened down the road. Well, in fact, two of them happened down the road from me. Really? Uh, there seemed to be, yeah, it's very strange. It's, it's strange. There are so many coincidences between Manchester, where I live, and Thomas Paine. It's, it's almost as if I'm being drawn along a path. So the book, is, the book is called Tom Paine's Bones because of the attempt to bring his bones back to England. Is that right? Yeah, and there's your other Manchester link. So um, 
a very strange English radical called William Cobbett, who'd been one of the people who'd been persecuting Paine and writing horrible vitriol against him, like so many did, had a sudden conversion. And in the kind of fanaticism of his uh, conversion to, to being a Paineite, he decided to go to New Rochelle in New York and dig up Paine's bones, as I say, in 1819, the year of the Peterloo massacre here in Manchester, and transported them over to England. And he thought that in the wake of all the civil unrest there was as a result of the way the authorities had behaved at Peterloo, he thought the presence of, of, of Payne's remains would spark a revolution. But of course, the authorities didn't let him anywhere near the city. He huh. stopped uh, at the borders. Um, well, but again, another strange link to Manchester. So we have kind of um, skipped over the fact, but you already mentioned that he sort of died impoverished and being besieged. Um, after being a, a hero of the revolution because he was a, a, an infidel. Um, he was persecuted in the United States as well. Uh, Thomas, Pay uh, Thomas Jefferson remained a friend, um, but a lot yes. of people threw him off. Well, we can't wait to see this book. When will uh, it be out? When will your book be in the stores? OK, well, I mean, the crowdfunder closed about two weeks ago. Uh, um, uh, much like Payne had difficulty getting his work published, I, I, I was damned if I was able to find a mainstream publisher to go with this. So we've had to self-fund it. Um, probably about a year to actually draw the thing, if it goes slowly. Um, so early 2022 is what I'm hoping for, that it will be available. Well, Paul, uh, and I really, really hope it's part of a, a movement to revive Payne's memory, because it's just... You know, people should be shocked by the fact that this man has been forgotten. People should be shocked and outraged by it. And there's, there's, as I say, there are reasons for it. Because he challenged religious authority, I think that's why he was erased from history. Well, Paul, we are so grateful um, for you for joining us uh, today and um, informing us about this forgotten hero and for your book. We look forward to seeing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we forgot to mention at the beginning of the show that you are welcome to ask questions, you the viewer, during the show at any time. You can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org, or you can just post it right there. If you're looking on Facebook, you can just post it right there in the Facebook comments. And now waiting in the wings are our other guests. We have uh, Margaret Downey from the Free Thought Society who is an ardent Thomas Paine aficionado and expert, and artist Zenas Frudakis, who both of you are in uh, the Philadelphia area. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And look at that statue there. Is that clay, Zenas? That is a 100-year-old clay that was, some of it was used to make the Lincoln Memorial. And a lot of the historical sculptures you see around the country, it's a very old plastoline. Wow. So, uh, Margaret, can you tell us first about the campaign, uh, the, the great need, the overlooked need to have a memorial to Thomas Paine, and what you've been doing about that? Well, um, I've been honoring Thomas Paine's legacy for over 30 years. I think he's a remarkable hero of free thought. Uh, and this is why he needs to have a statue in Washington, D.C. He is a symbol of freedom of thought, uh, citizens' rights, and the, the will and the power to overthrow monarchy. So uh, he's a very symbolic person for the United States of America. Now, I want to clear one thing up very quickly. Um, someone mentioned that Thomas Paine died in— um, uh, impoverished. But the truth is that his will actually showed that he had money in the bank and he had property. Uh, so I, I wanted to make sure people knew the, the truth about that, because um, here's the interesting part. We're going to tell a lot of uh, life information about Thomas Paine when we have our Thomas Paine Day celebration on Zoom. And people can sign up and be a part of it. But we're going to disclose all these facets in his life that have been, over the years, misunderstood and, and misconveyed. So uh, the truth is going to come out on June 8th about everything uh, Thomas Paine accomplished and, and the things he experienced in his life. 
And we're going to tell the story um, in, in sections. And each person involved in sponsoring this event will be telling Thomas Paine's story. So it's going to be a very interesting program featuring Mandisa Thomas, Tom Flynn, Andrew Sedell, and Gary Burton from the Thomas Paine National Historical Association. Uh, he's taught me a lot, by the way, about um, the truth of Thomas Paine uh, with all of his knowledge. You see, there was a time during Tom Paine's life and shortly afterwards where his reputation was um, tarnished because people wanted to get rid of the legacy of Thomas Paine. They were angry about the uh, age of reason and they tried to destroy him just like tabloids of today go after someone. And in fact, uh, there was a nasty story about Thomas Paine having been the father of Madame Bonneville's uh, son uh, who was named Thomas Paine. Uh, uh, but um, the truth was that he had nothing to do with uh, Madame Bonneville's son's birth. He just happened to be a friend. And she actually sued uh, and, and had that uh, question brought to court, and she won. <laughs> she won a judgment uh, against the person who was spreading that lie. So, um, Margaret, um, the Freedom from Religion Foundation and, and other secular groups are very pleased to be joining in on this Thomas Paine Day, June 8th. Is that that's marking his death? Yes. And, um, and it is customary in Europe to have a celebration of someone's life on the date of their death, not necessarily the date of their birth. So we adopted this tradition many, many years ago, 30 years ago, because it's a very nice time of year to um, have an outdoor event or, you know, the, have something that a lot of people can attend. Uh, Thomas Paine was born in January, so uh, the weather back east is pretty bad <laughs> in January. So we're very happy to have acknowledged June 8th as Thomas Paine Day. I've had many proclamations passed in various cities, uh, including Philadelphia, York, um, Lancaster, uh, even uh, Garden Grove, California, and um, Urbana, Illinois. And the reason I got a proclamation in those two states was because there's a Thomas Paine Elementary School located in California and in Illinois. We also have a Tom Paine Elementary School in New Jersey, and I have a proclamation from the New Jersey governor for Thomas Paine Day. So before uh, we switch to the statue, Margaret, how, uh, is that a Facebook page that's just called Thomas Paine Day, or how do people find that? Yes, they can find information about our Thomas Paine Day through the Facebook event page and through the Free Thought Society meetup page. And also it's being advertised by the Freedom From Religion Foundation, Center for Inquiry, American Humanist Association, and the Thomas Paine National Historical Association. And I think all of us are going to be putting those, uh, this information on our websites and um, circulate it. Well, thank you, and um, we will hopefully get back to you. But now we want to bring uh, on Zenos Frudakis, who's a world-renowned sculptor, and you're there in your studio with what you call a maquette of, of uh, yeah. Thomas Paine? Yes, this is a 25-inch model, and um, it will soon, I hope, be the same size as Ben Franklin back there. It'll be seven feet. I'm going to start the uh, seven-foot sculpture tomorrow, actually. I would have started a little earlier, but I, I wanted to wait till after our meeting. But uh, you do a small model first because you have to conceive the piece, and it's easier to make paintings at this scale than when they're larger, and you have to make a stiffer armature to hold it in place. Oh, Zenas, uh, uh, could you speak to the camera when you turn away? We uh, can't hear you. I'm sorry. Do you want me? You think I should put these earpieces in? No, I that think works. you're fine. No, that works. Um, just... We just uh, we're losing you. We're losing you. Is that better? Yeah, and uh, now uh, you've been working with Margaret and uh, the yes. Free Thought Society and FFRF and other groups. And um, mm -hmm. Margaret, you may want to say a little bit about this. Um, we are we haven't had an official announcement yet, but there's a a new association, the Thomas Paine Memorial Association, whose purpose is 
to get memorials up to Thomas Paine. And here we have the beginnings of this with, with yours, Zenos. First, don't we want to say that Zenos Fridakis is not just any old sculptor down the street. He's a world-renowned sculptor. He's got works all over, everywhere, all over the world. That famous uh, freedom sculpture in Philadelphia. It's a real honor to have someone of your caliber working. And then there's the Clarence Darrow. Sculpt. There's Annie Laurie, and there's this Clarence Darrow sculpture. And John in, Delancey there in, the, at, um, in Dayton, in Tennessee, Dayton Hills, Tennessee, at the Sculpts Trial. And Zenis, you made that sculpture. He's a little bit larger than life, isn't he, there? Yes. Um, usually outdoors, you want a piece to be a little larger than life, not just because they, they were, in a sense, but because if a life-size statue looks a little smaller than life in, in outdoors with the open sky and the space around it. But uh, Margaret's not going to be with us long, so I, I want her to speak. I don't want to. Hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, Mar Margaret, you're going to get your first COVID vaccine, so we we want you to go, and you have to. But do you want to talk a little bit about the formation of this association and what our plans are? Yes, the Thomas Paine Memorial Association is actively seeking funds uh, to um, support the making of a statue of Thomas Paine. And uh, we've been very, very happy to um, have been awarded some money from the uh, Stiefel Freethought Foundation and the James Hervey Johnson uh, uh, Memorial no, Educational Grant. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're on our way. But um, this is a very expensive project, and we want people to donate what they can and, and be a part of this historic event. Um, this is going to be uh, history making. And we're so happy that we're getting a lot of help and support from Congressman Jamie Raskin. He um, is a, a big supporter of Thomas Paine. And um, in fact, he's going to do the introductory statement for our Thomas Paine Day on June 8th. Wow. So you'll need to turn in, uh, tune in to see that and, and see what Jamie Raskin has to say. I'm sure it's going to be marvelous. And so, of course, he quoted Thomas Paine during, as impeachment manager. And if you go to his office, it's full of Thomas Paine books. So. Uh, another great admirer of Thomas Paine there. So, Margaret, yeah. Margaret, we can't just ask somebody like Zenis to make this wonderful sculpture and then, then go plunk it on the mall in Washington, D.C. Doesn't there have to be <clears throat> congressional resol resolution, or, or aren't there some steps that have to be done before this becomes a reality? Yes, yes, it's very complicated. Um, so we're, we're probably um, looking at a very a long, uh, year, maybe 12 to 14 years worth of work. I, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I think we could speed things along if, if we have help from other Congress people. Uh, and there seems to be a surge of interest from um, everyone from Anne Duran, uh, uh, Carl Sagan's widow, just announced that she's a, a big fan and how can she help with our efforts. Um, so people are going to come out and they're going to want to support this and, and we're going to get through this red tape. We've, we've gotten through red tape once before. Uh, back in 1994, President Bill Clinton actually signed a resolution giving us land to honor Thomas Paine. And unfortunately, the land, we lost the land because we did raise enough funds in the amount of time we were given to do so. And I don't want to see that happen again. So um, let's get the information out. Let's make sure people know that they can make a tax deductible uh, donation to the association, and they'll be a part of this statue and beyond. And I, I should hasten to say that we're preempting the announcement a little bit. We don't have a website up yet, but there are representative groups, such as the Freedom from Religion Foundation, the Free Thought Society, mm -hmm. Center for Inquiry, where a gift to the Thomas Paine Memorial can be earmarked. And we will soon have that web website up where people can donate directly. But uh, FFRF will be doing fundraising this spring, for example, and has already given funds for this. And so let's get back to you, Zenos. Um, tell us about the maquette. Tell us about the research you do before you start undertaking a statue like this? 
Uh, well, uh, of course, I've, I've read books about Thomas Paine, and Margaret and I have had many conversations because she's an expert on, on uh, Thomas Paine. Um, and while I'm working this, I'll probably be listening to a, a book that I've already heard, a biography. This is a kind of visual biography. Um, still developing it. If I knew the site where it was going to go, I would probably custom make it a little more to the site. So we have a little bit of, uh, of a handicap. We have to, I have to make him general enough, showing him with his pen and with uh, one of his pamphlets and make it so that it could fit almost any location. And, and um, I wanted to show him almost as if he just got up from a chair. In fact, if we had the budget, I probably would put a chair and a, a Thomas Paine desk behind him. But so he's just risen to the occasion with his writing. Um, I wanted to look like a visionary, which of course he was. And um, I'm excited, you know, as an atheist myself, to be an honored, really, to be part of this project, as I was with the Clarence Darrell, that FFRF, um, you know, um, sponsored that, and we were able to, I think, make a difference in Dayton and uh, contribute. <laughs> Uh, Claire's Darrell to that um, narrative there about uh, uh, you know the the, um, uh, the the judgment about the creationism and evolution and so on. So I think you know to me, I'm, I've always wanted to be part of 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 a group, and I didn't know there was a group until I've met the Free Thought Society and the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and now we have uh, others that that I can promote the idea of more sculptures of godless people. There aren't enough of them of people who are scientific and people were rational. There's so many sculptures that are religious or they're, you know, they're not of people that, and you see it in our time now, we just went through this four terrible years of uh, irrational gov government, executive uh, government and so on, that uh, we need more of, I think, of, 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 of sculptures of people that represent reason. And, you know, he, he is the epitome of reason. And um, I, I did that even I'm doing a Franklin who was the, uh, who brought the, Amer in a sense, the American en Enlightenment, created it uh, from the Enlightenment uh, in, in uh, Europe and in France and so on in England with John Locke. But um, he was, you know, he gave Thomas Paine the letter of introduction when he came to uh, America. And I even visualized perhaps sometime I can have a sculpture situation with both of them together. But um, I think that w this, I've already been through the process in Washington with my um, honor guard that's at this part of the Air Force, National Air Force Memorial in Arlington National Cemetery. It didn't take as many years because influential people got behind it. It took only a couple of years or so to, I think, get it through the legislative through the, um, the, um, uh, all those committees that, that rule the, uh, what goes up in, in Washington. If we have, I think, Jamie Raskin and others who get behind it, we could probably, I'm hoping, fast track it, because it won't take me more than a year or two, or depending, I have other commissions, I'm doing several other seven foot sculptures, so it might take me a couple of years to finish this, but by that time, perhaps we'll have gone through that process and if we don't have a, if, if it's even possible, we can find a, a place that's in public, but it's maybe private, locate, you know, a space in terms of the land, that maybe that's another way to, to get it up in a, it, we won't ha perhaps not need the same kind of, of um, legislation. I'm not sure. But once I have the large sculpture done and I make a rubber mold on it, we could have a, another wax and, and then a bronze made for Philadelphia where he wrote, many of the things he wrote, Common Sense and others, or we can have him in, um, have one in New Rochelle or have one in uh, New York. New York City has a Thomas Paine uh, Park area near, the, uh, near City Hall. So we can actually um, have more of him. Um, I think it would be a, a great thing for to have more, we could spread reason all around. Hmm. Certainly the country needs it. So you're in Philadelphia. You and Margaret are both in that area. You're walking yes. the streets that Thomas Paine used to walk, aren't you? Yes. He's, he's an inspiration, mm. as is Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to put one more plug in about the uh, June 8th plans for Thomas Paine Day. Uh, we're going to begin uh, with a 15-minute concert by my friend James Clue, and he has written songs of with the theme of Thomas Paine's life. And they're original and they're beautiful. 
and he's going to set off the entire program with, with this 15-minute concert that I think everybody would really enjoy. Uh, and Dan, you're going to sing your song. That's um, right. That, the world that is my country. Yeah, you did a beautiful job with that. We're going to have that song played right after the live story is told. And uh, just before people are invited to uh, make toasts to Thomas Paine. By the way, on June 8th, it's a BYOB event. So we're going to have many t opportunities to toast to our hero. Remotely, still. But, yes, but that that'll be very satisfying, and of course, Representative uh, Jared Huffman, who's uh, co-chair of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus with Jamie Raskin, also is talking about uh, instituting something in Congress with Thomas Paine. I think he's thinking about his birthday, uh, January 29th, or possibly I think he wants to do something opposite the national um, prayer breakfast, which is usually in uh -huh. February. So we'll have to see what transpires there. But we definitely see that there is something in the air about resurrecting um, the, the words and vision of Thomas Paine. And the cottage okay. in Lewisville is being reconstructed, as well as the museum. So um, mark your calendars for uh, June 2022 uh, for the grand opening of the uh, cottage that was given to Thomas Paine by the American government uh, to thank him for his service. Uh, and then the museum will be opened again and probably house the collection that is now in Iona College. And where is where is that museum and cottage? In, in New Rochelle. New Rochelle. New, yeah. So that's okay. going to be a big festival. Well, wow. that that will be it. And that would that will be June 8th, too? Probably. Wonderful. Things to look forward to after the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I have, can, I, can I say one more thing? Of and it has to do with, we're just talking about words. To me, depending on the location, um, I think it's important to have some of his words, quotations. I uh, left a space here on, the, on his base so we can have a quote from the rights of man. So people have something to read, something edifying, and we can have quotes from... Uh, you know, the age of reason and, co and common, common sense, sense and so on. Yeah, so we should have a very strong quote, at least on each side. I've got, we, depending on, again, where it eventually is, Mark, you can help me pick a quote or two. But we can have, um, I think it's very important that people, if they come to the sculpture, that they are educated about them. If they don't know much about him, that they, that there is uh, probably, there should be a bronze plaque that talks about his life, but also some very strong quotations. We've already heard some today. I got uh, one, Zenis. I got one. Yes. These are still the times that try men's and women's, <laughs> men's and women's souls, maybe. Yes. Very good. So. You know, um, after the um, second impeachment, I I just was heartbroken for Jamie Raskin, and, and I immediately sent him a text thanking him for all the hard work he did uh, to um, to try to get that impeachment approved and passed. But what I told him was, uh, Thomas Paine said, we have it in our power to begin the world again. And he really appreciated that. And we do. We do have it in our power. Yes. And uh, James Baldwin kind of said the same thing in to the 60s. To begin again. To begin again. Um, for so many reasons, civil rights. I think one thing people don't know is, you know, Raskin suffered a horrible loss in his family. His son had died just a couple of weeks before that, and his son's name was Tom, who was named after you know who. Yes, yeah, yeah. One of the other quotes I really enjoy uh, reading and, and during this time uh, with the health crisis and, and all the political turmoil and and bigotry and hatred going around. Uh, Thomas Paine said, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. Huh. Wow. And I, I, I'm mm. not sure if we have questions, but I did want to ask one more question of you, Zenos. Um, yes. Which I wondered if you could explain the process. Uh, you have this sort of a miniature model called a maquette that's behind you. Yes. And, yes. Then, and then how does that become a seven-foot-tall statue? 
Well, I water it, and uh, no. Um, this is a smaller Franklin. This shows you the, the, dis the difference. Um, well, what ha used to happen in the past is I would put up a lot of wire and wood, and I would build an arm. I would build a seven-foot frame, and then put the clay on it because you need the clay won't stay up there by itself. It needs just as we do. We have bones, just like Payne had. Tom Payne had bones that were still. But we um, this the, you have a metal armature, and um, and so. But now what we do? We, I, I'll have a computer scan made of this, and then it'll be cut out very roughly in foam. And sort of be a lot lighter, and uh, it'll be delivered to my studio. That'll be that'll happen at the foundry, and then I put clay on it, and then I have to work on it over time. And as I work on it, it will evolve. Well, there he is, yeah. similar to. And uh, I'm not exactly sure how it'll end up, but uh, that's the exciting part of the journey. We already knew how it was going to live, you know, work out. Why live that life, right? You want it uh, unfold. Same with the sculpture. So it'll it'll take a while. I've got I've got a costume actually. Let me leave for a moment. I'll be right back. I, when I um, did the Ben so, Franklin, yes, while he's, go ahead. While he's making the costume, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew um, why Thomas Paine is so important. He was the first to write about uh, women's rights. He uh, was the first to um, talk about social security, public schools, uh, animal rights, and um, he even came up with the concept of the United Nation. So a lot of people don't know that about Thomas Paine, and they should. Yeah, and he was an abolitionist as well. Abolitionist, yes. Yeah. So, so, so I have to, to go, and I want to thank everyone for the energy and enthusiasm about Thomas Paine, and thank you for uh, working with the Free Thought Society and being such great people mm. to 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 support the activities of the Thomas Paine Memorial Association. Mm. And we're going to do this. Yep. So, so go, well, get, you, go get your shot, Margaret. I will. Goodbye. And, and then send us, uh, you've got a costume well, there from the trip. This is, I had this made by uh, Craig Danos, who's a, he's an expert on, on uh, costumes. And so I wanted something historically accurate. Now this was for the Ben Franklin, and I have the shoes and everything. Um, and uh, for Thomas Paine, I'm gonna have to have something made that's uh, specifically something he would have worn. It's, it's similar to this, but uh, so you can see it. Yeah. So it's uh, it's just part of the the research, you know, to be just like if you're doing research for a portrait, uh, a, a biography, you've got to, you know, get it accurate, and it adds to the credibility. You don't want it to have because there are a lot of statues of that period, Revolutionary War, which have costumes and clothing that's more a kind of Hollywood version of what they would have worn, rather, you know, uh, than uh, uh, something that's accurate. So, so Zenis, we do have a question from a viewer, Travis yes. Tooney. Uh, I think you might have touched on this. How long does it take to design a sculpture like that? Well, the most often asked question I get about sculpture is, how long did it take you to make it? I just did a, a Ulysses S. Grant, for example, people ask me that. You know, it, I tell them it took 69 years. You know, whatever <laughs> age I am, at the time that I do the sculpture, that's how long it took because you put your life into it. Now, the actual labor, it depends. If you have a deadline, you, it, you, you finish it by deadline. If there's, uh, but if, um, if, if it's a little more open, as in this case, I think, um, you work on it. It might be a year, two years, depending on how much other work you have. I have a lot of work, but you know, I'm guessing it'll probably be a year and a half to two years, maybe sooner. Um, it's like writing a poem, though, sometimes, you, you know, when the, when the poem comes and the rhymes are there, you're done. And if it takes longer, sometimes it takes longer. Um, usually, once you're finished with your statement, if you find yourself just changing it but not making it better, then you're done. You should have quit. So you, you stop. So Paul Fitzgerald is watching right now. We interviewed him earlier oh. on the show. And he said he wants to know if it's possible that we could get a close-up of his face would that be hard to do, or would, oh, you, would that be too risky? Well, the, the the only thing that's risky about it is that I didn't develop the face a lot yet. What I'll do is a dip, I'll do a seven foot head. Let's see if I can get it. You can get it there. This is just a very rough uh, uh, head. Can you see it? 
Yeah. I just did this just as a placeholder. And what happens when I get the foam in here, do you see it? Yeah, we see oh, it, see. yeah. Um, he had a nose. You know, I've got, I've got pictures of a life mask or a death mask, whatever that is, I think. And I have, um, I have a lot of the paintings and drawings. So what I'll do is I'll work on a, a, a seven foot scale head separately. I'll cut, a, cut, cut the foam, I'll cut his head off and work on it and then attach it later. Because wow. it's, it's hard to get up on the ladder and continually work on it. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's what I'll do. Does that answer his, uh, so you can I see it? I think so. Well, Payne almost lost his head, you know, in the French Revolution. Yes. <laughs> so you can, by that X on the door. So you, the, uh, you can put it yeah. back on the body. <laughs> So we have, we have a question from Brianna Vind, who wants to know if any of us think that Thomas Paine would have been more accepted if he had been a Christian at the time. Well, if he had been a traditional Christian at the time, I don't think he would have been Thomas Paine. <laughs> and he would not have written, <laughs> he wouldn't have written The Age of Reason. It was because he was so unorthodox and he was pushing the envelope and he wasn't constrained by religion sure. and revealed religion that he was who he was. Well, I think the example of Ms. Cage, right? She was one of the three feminists and she got kind of lost in the history because um, Susan B. Anthony and, and because she was the, the non-believer. Oh, that Matil true? Matilda Jasson Gage. Yeah. Yes. Well, they were so all non-believers, but she was very ardent. She was more ardent, yeah. So... Um, Actually, there should be a statue of her because she's yeah. lost too. Although I have to say, I think Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the better writer. Huh. So we have another question. Um, Mike is asking, wasn't his book Common Sense considered propaganda back in his day? I'm not sure what that means. Well, this, is propaganda always a negative thing? I mean, if, if it's defined as trying to change opinion in a popular way, yeah. then maybe that's not negative. Well, uh, he was propagating an idea. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, sculpture is propaganda as well, by the way. And it's not history. You know, you get the argument, people say, well, let's not take down this sculpture because we're losing history. But it can be good propaganda, as you say, in the sense of you're promoting, you're telling people, don't forget about, let's say, Thomas Paine. Um, but it's not a complete history, you know, so it's not, uh, it, when you see sculptures of Southern ge Confederate generals, those are propaganda, but not in a good way, because they're propagating a myth rather than a, a reality, rather than accurate history. Well, people were readers back then. They couldn't go to the movies. They couldn't watch Hulu. Yeah, so you they know, were they really had to avid to those, read these handbills. These handbills and, and uh, papers that were printed really made a huge difference in the beginning of our country. So it was kind of like, uh, they didn't have the internet. He couldn't write a blog or... <laughs> so we do have a question unrelated to Thomas Paine. Is there anything else we want to talk about with Paine before... Uh... Did you want to add anything, Zenos, about Paine? Well, um, I, I'm just excited to be part of this and to be, to tr tr in a way that we can create more visibility for him again. He deserves it. And we can't, even though we can't find his bones, in a sense, we are finding his bones and we're fleshing them out so that people can be reminded of his significance in our history and in terms of reason. Well, you are literally embodying Thomas Paine. And yes. you, Thank you. And you touched on the title of the book of our first guest, Paul Fitzgerald's book. Tom Paine's bones. So, yes. uh, so what, a, what a rich history. What a great story there. Well, thanks for all you're doing, Zenos. There's the book. Well, thank you. Tom Paine's bones will be out sometime next year, a fantastical visual biography. And we do hope everybody will, who's excited about this will help contribute to the Thomas Paine Memorial. And we will have more information. And when that website's up, uh, we can um, let everybody know, too. Thank you, Zenas. Thank, thank you so much, you. Zenas, for everything. Thank you. Very exciting. Thank you. You, you can stay on if you want. There's a question about the uh, Pope. Sure. Oh. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> what? Know, um, we have a viewer, uh, Glenn Jocelyn, says, have we heard about the recent Vatican decision about gay marriage? She would love to get our take on this. Yes, and I hope we have a statement out soon. Of course, totally predictable, except that 
everybody was treating uh, Pope Francis as if he was a radical change, and he was going to change from within, and he's just window dressing. And that statement that they put out two days ago about how priests cannot partake in anything to do with a gay union or gay marriage was mm. so insulting, um, so, yeah. try, so demeaning, uh, and so anti-civil uh, liberties, uh, and um, would put gay—you know, treat gay people, LGBTQ people, like they're sinners, really. And uh, this is why we don't need the Catholic Church. This is why we think people should step away from the Catholic Church en masse, stop— En uh, masse. St yes. Stop, I get it. Stop en supporting masse. what suppresses and oppresses, if not you, then your friends or neighbors. So uh, the Catholic Church is so retrogressive, so harmful. Well, this so is a, a prime example of doublespeak, because Pope Francis has been saying we honor gays and their contributions to our church and on and on. but. The gay sexual lifestyle is a sin, and so it cannot be blessed. So which is it? Do they honor gays or do they not? So I, I'm kind of thinking a lot of gays will be leaving about this time. Well, I hope so. And, and you know, they do have a global campaign against LGBTQ rights, and especially uh, reproductive rights. The Catholic Church is responsible for a huge amount of misery and oppression. So that would be my statement. And I think—do uh, we have anything else? No, no more live questions. Uh, well, I, I think we've gone on long enough. And uh, Zenas, you're still there. Thank you so much. We want to thank our other thank guests you. who have had to leave, Margaret Downey from Free Thought Society and Paul Fitzgerald, such a talented artist, graphic artist, with his new book coming out, Tom Payne's Bones. Thanks again for joining us, and thank you, Zenas, uh, for working with us on this very important memorial. And thank you for watching Ask an Atheist, and we'll be back next week, same time, same place, uh, noon central Wednesdays, uh, where you can uh, tune in and ask, hopefully, questions and comment. Thank you.